Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Traction.gg podcast, where we talk about racing games, esports, and sim racing. And it's my pleasure to say that joining us today is the former principal and CEO of the Sauber Formula One team and current CEO of Racing Unleashed, it's Manisha Kaltenborn. Hello. Hello. How are you today? Very well, thank you. And you? Yeah, not bad, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to uh, speak to you today. Um, first of all, I just want to ask, uh, whereabouts in the world are you these days? I'm in Switzerland. I have been located there actually for the last 21 years. Right. <laughs> um, maybe surprisingly, because Switzerland is not really known for its motorsport activities, but That's we true. Do work out from here. We have our headquarters near Zurich. I see. Yes. Well, I was, I was going to ask about that. But before I jump into the locations of uh, Racing Unleashed, for those who may not know already, if you could just explain what is Racing Unleashed in, in the simplest of terms for, for people who may not be already aware. Well, Racing Unleashed is a group of companies uh, working out of Switzerland. Um, we're having our production facilities in Italy, actually in Maranello, which people might know from a different brand. <laughs> yeah. Actually yep. engaged in motorsport. Um, and what we do is we uh, pursue our vision, which is to make motorsport accessible to everyone in a safe way, in a risk-free way, and in a sustainable way. And all this should actually be fun for everyone. So we are in virtual racing. We uh, develop, we produce very high-end simulators, the technology being derived from Formula One, and make that accessible to anyone who wants to drive. Brilliant. Well, that certainly sounds interesting. Let's um, dig a little deep, deep, deeper then, if that's okay. So, so first of all, and correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is you have a series of uh, racing unleashed lounges uh, in various locations. Uh, I believe you may have expanded to Mu Munich and Zurich earlier this year. Is that correct? Yes, that And then is people correct. can uh, book for either a, a time slot or with a group or become a, a yearly member. Yes, so, that's absolutely correct. We, we are working out of Switzerland. We have couple of lounges. We have one in Zurich, one here at our headquarters in Cham, at Kemptal, which is all still the Zurich area. Let's put it like this. We have two franchises already, which is nearby here and in Yverdon, the French speaking part. We opened up a lounge just recently in Munich. We have a lounge in Madrid as well. Oh, I see. Yes. I wasn't aware of the Madrid one as well. So I guess in the future, the plural, there would be, it'd be nice to have for more of these lounges around Europe, correct? Not only Europe, we are already oh. quite advanced in England. Um, we are going to be present there with another project, actually, but it involves our simulators too. Um, it concerns F4, but maybe that's another point we'll, we'll look at. Sure. Um, we're then looking at the Arab region, of course, mm. and subject to how corona restrictions permit us to travel. Of India course. is coming up, the US are on our agenda. So actually, we want to be global. Oh, that's very interesting. And, and selfishly, from my point of view, when you mentioned England there, I was like, oh, yep, that's, that suits me because that's where, that's where I'm based. So obviously when that project is, uh, is open, so to speak, I will hopefully be able to check that out and looking forward to it. So I, I would usually in the past, you know, maybe book uh, go-karting with friends and we'd have an experience for half an hour or so. Would you say that Racing Unleashed is a rival to that or does it sit alongside that? Or is it something completely different? No, it is alongside that. Actually, Racing Unleashed covers a lot of segments, what you can do. What you're now talking about is like the event sector, right. which we yeah. call it. So, you know, you go there with a couple of friends, um, depending how many simulators they are. You know, they can be groups even up to 20, 30, 40 people. Um, and you have a race maybe together. So we have these timing tools. We, you can race against each other. You could have some friends sitting actually at another lounger party. And you could also race against them without any latency. So um, it, it's an event platform on the one side, but on the other side, it is also for people who from having, just wanting to have fun and driving and just seeing how is it to experience, let's say a Formula One car, because most people would like to drive one at some point of time. Of course, of course. That most people do, you know, and yeah, on yeah, top yeah. of it, always a red one for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's the kind of feeling we can give you that if you are just zipping down the straight, let's say in Monza, and you get a very immersive feeling of how it is to experience that speed. And because we also technically have the capability through reverse engineering, replicate downforces, of course, only to a certain extent via the belts. If you actually crash into a wall, you remain safe, but you feel the impact. Ah, yes. So you really, you know, you have your own feeling that when you see 
the drivers on the weekend driving there, you can say, well, I do know quite how it is like, but you remain nice and safe if something is to happen. Of course. Then it goes all the way to, let's say, the young people who want to see this potentially as a racing career. And not just for, for sim racing or virtual racing, but also, as I've just recently heard the word, analog racing. So it's not just because all drivers are real drivers. So you, know, you of can differentiate between virtual drivers and analog drivers. Um, so that's equally in there. Uh, a trainings instrument for these kind of people, two gentlemen drivers who have fantastic cars at home, but don't have the time to drive it. So we can replicate that car and you can drive that too. So it actually covers from entertainment to sport. I see. There's actually quite a lot to unpack there, and it's clear that the scope is is very broad. So just to uh, dip into one particular element there, you mentioned that you can you can feel the motions. You know, if you have an incident, I, I believe just talking about the hardware, if that's okay, it's a the, like a triple monitor setup. It's a motion platform. So and that's an element that might be made in Maranello. Is that is that correct? So that if true. you could. Uh, enlighten us on the process to, to get to that point where you had the finished design and then you started building them out to sure. the locations. Um, so like I said before, you know, we develop the simulator, we produce right. it and distress. It's all in our hands. You know, so a lot of technology comes from Formula One. Yep. For example, the brakes, and that's with, which is a big difference when you look at GT drivers because the brakes are much tougher, actually. Mm. But it's just different. You know, just have to be used to it. Um, the steering wheel is actually the way a Formula One steering wheel is. We could put in much more, many more buttons in there, but it is like that. It looks like that. The seat is very similar, but not to worry, it's not that narrow because we have to have obviously cater to a bigger group of, of people. Than of course. Formula One drivers. So the chassis looks very similar, that part of the bodywork. So this hardware, we develop ourselves. Um, there's this motion platform, which we have worked on, perfectioned in a certain way. We have um, on the hardware side, we're working on the seat. We want to make that more immersive, you know, that moves along more. We have developed um, coaching tools, which we put on the system. And then as you'll come to the software side later. So this is a lot about the hardware, yeah. which we develop ourselves. And the process is there that we have our people, our facility factory, actually right opposite Ferrari's one of main entrances. I see. Um, Very nice location. So we look right across to their, one of their main entrances. <laughs> and that's where all this mainly on the hardware side is done. I see. Well, I just wanted to touch quickly on the software, if that's okay. So I believe it's built upon a set of course, but I believe then uh, you have your own elements built in because I did see there was the, the Zurich airport circuit. Is that correct? Recently, which is clearly a unique thing for Racing Unleashed. So uh, what's the thinking process behind creating your own venues? Um, well, it is part of our story when it comes to the software, because we, what we want to do is if you want to be accessible to everyone, you have to get to start with platform agnostic at some point of time. Right. Okay. Um, now, we're not into developing a whole new game because that wouldn't really make any commercially any sense for us. I don't think it would. But it, it, it takes so many years and many, Absolutely. many millions to develop Absolutely. a video game. So we chose our set of Casa. Um, but we are working on a system which is then agnostic to the platform. So we can then, you know, plug it into any other app. I hope to manage that in about a year and a half or two. I see. Um, based, however, on this software which we have, we've developed two further layers. One has got to do with indeed the immersive feeling to make that, you know, more realistic for people. The other one is a management tool, uh, which is again very important for the tracks, for the competition we have for evaluate, collecting and evaluating the data you generate in terms of the coaching tools that, and whatever you want to see from there for the different applications. Right. Okay, so our, our people, um, you mentioned earlier, and I think they are, but let's touch upon the training aspect of these simulators. So if I am, um, I've decided to go out and buy myself a nice racing car, but obviously I don't have any form of racing experience, I could then visit Race and Unleashed, visit one of the lounges, and then it's not just the fact that I'm playing on a motion simulator. It's the fact I can look at data, prepare my performance, and go through some form of training. Yes. Um, has that been uh, satisfying to see people go on that journey with Racing Unleashed? We have started that now, actually, because, you know, there are so many products out there. So what yeah. makes you different? That's what we are about. We want to be different and unique in our ways. So from that perspective, we've developed a coaching tool now, which hopefully will be introduced at the beginning of next year. I see. We've already put on a telemetry tool, telemetry software tool, rather. Mm -hmm. So 
from that tool, you know, what you can do is you could book uh, a session with a coach. Right. Um, and then the coach, you know, gets into the system, wherever the coach, it doesn't have to be sitting next to you. You Ooh, drive. Um, and then he can like drive behind you. He can drive in front of you. He can drive with you, against you. He sees the telemetry data and he is in communication with you. So actually he can even be talking to you and telling you, you better break here, right. don't break so early or don't break that late, you know, anything like this. So uh, this is the starting point for us, but uh, this is the way, you know, we want to go that you allow people to, to get this coaching and to improve their racing, their lines and, and their time, lap time at the end of the day. I see. I mean, in some ways that could almost be more in depth than a, a analog a driving coaching experience, so to speak. That's a new that's a new term for me as well. I just I just learned it from you earlier. I'm going to use it from now on. Um, it's a nice one, actually. It's, it's a good a, one. Yeah, real are both. Um, exactly. But I you am, have to differentiate. I, if I am sim racing, I am still a human being, and it's my real actions that are taking part. So it's a good way of mentioning it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if I was going to an analog training session, obviously they might be able to sit alongside me. But with this also, they can view you live on every single corner and the data live, mm-hmm. and be in your ear. Uh, more accurately. So that's a very uh, innovative and interesting element of that. Um, one thing I did see on one of the uh, launch videos that I was watching, you had like um, Heinz Held Frentzen, uh, who's a former Formula One driver, and you had uh, 2011 DTM champion Martin Tomczyk. They were there. Have you had some positive feedback from some uh, analog drivers? Absolutely. You should actually look at the complete video, maybe. It's a bit long because they do speak in that. Maybe it's just, you know, the German version of it. I don't know. Yeah, I did and only see a German version of it. So it was- that is not my core competence, unfortunately. <laughs> but I saw them and they were they had a smile on their face. So I yes. thought it was positive. Yep. They were very, very, very happy with what they experienced. They didn't expect that, particularly Lucas Auer. And right. it was so spontaneous because we'd not asked them to, to, you know, at the opening say anything. And they just came in with the camera and they were so positive about it. You know, even current drivers who are racing analog. Right. Um, so it was a very nice feeling for us to see that actually people enjoy it, which is the most important thing for us. Motorsport, you should enjoy. It. Yeah. And this is what they do. And they said you really realistically, you know, you feel it, what you are doing. So you get a very good impression of what drivers are actually doing on track. And it really deserves a lot of respect because, you know, you have to be physically very fit to even sit in our simulator. Because if you do this for half an hour, you're sweating or 15 minutes. You really are sweating. And you need a certain mental fitness as well when you are in the competition. So we actually are exactly going the way the analog world does. That you look at your driver, he has to be fit in many different ways. This is a competition. You have to be spot on. Um, the only difference is that it's accessible to far more people, affordable by far more people, and you can even tap onto an enormous talent pool like this. Exactly, and that's that's a very good point. I think this is a an appropriate uh, time to mention. Where do you see sim racing and analog racing? fitting now i mean personally i believe they're they're intrinsic at the minute especially if you're a new upcoming real world racing driver or you have the aspirations of that and you want to do well in esports and perhaps uh, win prize money or a prize drive or something like this do you see that evolving further in the future the, this relationship between the two worlds or do they, do they become one almost um they will continue to merge in a certain way i fully believe you know they both need to exist so we actually complement each other right and um Obviously, somebody who sees this as a, a profession will still want to maybe at the end of the day, at the moment, still make that step into the analog mm. world. That, I think, will change because a lot of that depends on how sim racing is promoted, how much of money is involved in it, and that's growing yeah. much quicker. Yeah. Is, yeah. So, And the big difference is, and why I think it will, at the end of the day, and I think it will go quicker than we all think, move a lot more into sim racing because you can attract far more people and it's about the driver you know it's at the end yeah. in sim racing you always speak about it it's not about manufacturers in there and and uh, you know other big names in there it's the driver because you should have a platform which is same for everyone correct that's what we try to ensure because everything is done in our lounges so we, we avoid the situation where you might have very smart people at home who then maybe do a bit of twists and tweaks and suddenly get a few tenth out yes uh, that might have happened before would have happened so we try to straight away avoid that and you'll be surprised how identical the emotions are 
if you know, you know, oh, yeah. track racing and this, you know, people will come to you and say, my track temperature was two degrees more than the others. And that's why my tires were not doing that. You've heard that, you've seen that. It's exactly the same thing, you know. That's why the drivers are absolutely comparable to me, equal. Yeah. And I think we should all, you know, stop always differentiating between them, but try to get them. Because from the, let's say, track racing world or analog world, where are we going to? We are going towards simulation. We want to save money. We want to be sustainable. We want to make it accessible equally to people. And that not, it's not said if you just have enough money, you get into the sport. It's exactly the same thing. And that's why you need to bring the worlds together and make the young people like we start with these tools. And then they're used to it from day one. Exactly. I think that's a very important point. And I think you mentioned there as well that there are some drivers who want to start in esports and go to the analog world. But the, there is actually now a full life career in sim racing if you want it. And there are actually several very, very talented drivers who who don't care about the analog world so much. They just know that if they do well, they've got some sponsors, they've got a team, and they can win prize money, and that, that's their career. Um, I was speaking to a, an esports, very good esports driver recently called Moritz Lohner, and um, I was doing some research about him, and I, I saw he took actually part in, uh, there's a Racing Unleashed Racer League, which is a form yeah. of esports. So if you could, what what's the uh, thinking behind the Racer League? For those who don't know, you can watch it on the Racing Unleashed YouTube channel, the, the previous rounds. It seems like a, a good, fun initiative. How has it been for you? Well, it's a very exciting project because uh, our target is here also to establish a worldwide sport. Um, so we've started now with uh, two leagues in the yep. competition. One is the Racer League, which is meant for the, let's say, professionals or yep. more professionals, and the Challenger Leagues, which are the ones uh, who occasionally will come and maybe are not that good, but maybe want to even go into the Racer League. So these are the two groups we look at. We want to continue to make them bigger. We offer them price money at every race, which you can win, um, which tells them, you know, the appreciation behind this is not just fun. You are racing for something. Uh, there's real competitive story out there. And if you follow the Racer League particularly, you already see it is interesting if you look at Formula One right now. There's equally a very strong rivalry there between two top drivers. There certainly is. And guy. And the tech guy, yeah, yeah. Um, and how they, you know, get to it, how they have their people around it. So it is no different from the real world. And the idea of this is all that the more we get into this pool of drivers, I give them contracts, um, and we we don't bind them by exclusivity, not at all. That's not our thinking. Okay. Our thinking is more you come and take part with us because you think we are good. And we are, have invested a lot into broadcasting this year. So we actually have a live broadcast of this. We have different commentators sitting in different areas. From next year on, we're going to do it in English as our main channel. I see. And then give the signal to other languages. That's what I it see. Like this. That would certainly um, help viewers like myself. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, you know, it'll again make it very exciting because we want top racers to come to us, to take part there and to establish this, this championship in such a way where it then gets interesting to bring in the concept of teams, to have different kind of sponsors you attract, more eyeballs. And that's what I said before. You will see how quickly this market grows because you can reach out to far more people and very strategically go into markets without requiring the investment right. of a track, of a gr huge event which costs you millions and millions. Um, you don't have that. And you even avoid situations, you know, should you go into a country because of politics or not? We don't have those discussions. Of course. We're in a very free world. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And also, actually, just one, that's a, that's a really good point. We touched on one thing there I'd just like to highlight as well, which I often think is overlooked when it comes to esports, is that you could have someone who does really well in the Unleashed Race League, and but you mentioned they're not on exclusive contracts, which is great because in esports, I feel like there's more scope for, adaptability of different types of vehicle so the same driver in one year could be in like a formula style racing unleashed motion rig but then also later in the year they could win a gt competition they could win a touring car competition and i find that fascinating to follow certain drivers across different different mm -hmm. disciplines i think it'll be remiss of me to not touch upon your time in formula one if that's okay so obviously you were the the ceo and the co-owner of sauber formula one team you were the first female team principal in Formula One as well, which are incredible achievements. Uh, do you ever look back upon your time in Formula One? And, and, and if you do, um, what would you say would be your proudest moments? Well, I always like to look back at my time because I've learned a lot there. There were many right. downs, but there were equally many ups. 
And the kind of exposure and opportunity I got there is very unique. You know, not many people and particularly women don't get these kind of opportunities. I'm very grateful for that. Um, and of course, what I always like to look back is the year 2012, where we were at Sauber, a little private team fighting against Mercedes. Right. It was B4, B5 in the championship, which we unfortunately didn't manage. But it was a great season for us. You know, we've had great times with BMW, where you learn a lot how a manufacturer works and approaches these kind of things. Before that, our successes too. So you learn a lot about motorsport at that level, which helps you later on to know what, can, what you need to take along, what you need to do differently, and what is important in both worlds. Oh, I see. And, and so are there any uh, direct learnings from your time at Sauber to, to Racing Unleashed? You know, is it comparable, uh, the role that you do today? It's very much comparable because we treat our car, and although it's just a mathematical, mathematical model mm. at the end of the day, we treat it like a Formula One car. So we are every year developing it. We have our development plan. We are adapting it to the rules, which are, are the current one or the, the closest to the current ones. That's like it. our current car mm. is a generic model of the 2020 car. We didn't take 21 because there was not that much of a difference. So we said this, we will continue, but we'll change again next year. We're constantly oh, working on elements like the steering wheel, like the seat, like more immersiveness into it. Of course, our targets are a bit different, but the thinking behind it to constantly be innovative, like with the track you mentioned, you know, we, we for the first time, we have done a track of our own and that also here in Switzerland, where uh, after 70 years, even though it's virtual, you have a racing track and that's through the airport. Uh, so it's a very, very exciting project. Um, you learn that kind of thinking. You learn to be effective, spot on, quick in reaction, because esports is a very, very quickly developing market. You can't think in two or three years down the road here. You have to think on a very short term basis because things are constantly evolving and people are moving. People are developing things and you want to be in front. So you take that along. You take along on the commercial side. What were sponsors not happy about? You know, what did they want different? What do you want to give your fans? And then you're not bound by the restrictive elements um, and by agreements, which you have done, let's say, with the Federation. So you exactly can take that along. And having the freedom we have here, you can implement then what you couldn't implement over there. And yet the target is to be as close as to analog racing. And you need to know that to be able to achieve that target. I see. Yeah. And I fully agree with you there. Esports is evolving so quickly. It's um, very impressive. I think last year was um, a watershed moment, but I see 2021 as well. Things are still continuing to grow, both from the number, the driver talent and the technology. And yeah, it's uh, clearly a, a chief priority of Racing Unleashed there to be on top of all that. Uh, I'd just like to ask you, do you, do you still follow a comp contemporary Formula One? And, and if you have, uh, have you enjoyed this season at all? Of course I follow it. I actually still have <laughs> contact to a lot of people in there with whom I wish to have contact. Uh, that's Liberty one has now. And uh, actually a very dear friend of mine is one of these, the former um, deputy team principal of Force India. Ah. I've just launched a, a project uh, in uh, in the UK with motorsport.com. It's the Formula 4 project, Race, Race Start. Ah, yes. I, I've seen something about that. So what's what's your involvement with that? Well, when it comes to the stage after the online uh, phase, right. into the simulators, they're going to be our simulators, which will be in the UK. Oh, I see. Yes, yes. Oh, well, I think we have got an article about that on Traction GG. So we'll we'll link that in, in uh, the description of this episode below. Uh, but that's a very uh, interesting and unique um, proposition, that, because I think the, the prize is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And the fact that people are competing online and then using the race and unleash simulators, it just shows the, the progression and also the difference between perhaps what you can do at home and then the, the, exactly. the step up to the race yeah. and unleashed, right? Yeah, so I guess you'd be yeah. excited to be involved in that. Absolutely. It's the road right there. And, and the season, of course, is exciting because finally it's a season, you know, with more races and not like before. However, you, I think we were always careful, even in the times before, not to have too many races, you know, it, it, yeah. it's particularly for the people as well involved because... Uh, you often underestimate or the, the, the racetrack people, the amount of pressure which is on them. 
And coming from a small team, I know what it means if you don't have a bunch of people who you can keep on rotating. But that's exactly. quite tough for them, maybe also for the product itself. You know, you always have to be careful how much you want to put out there on the market. It's, of course, very exciting to see a title fight after long. Um, my personal view is just that it's, um, you know, what all has been happening the last few races. Mm. Maybe something, if I look back at my time in Formula One, it already there used to be often very political. And I don't think that's what fans want to see. Yeah. You know, they, they want racing and, and you have to let people race. Yeah, well, uh, just uh, full disclosure, we are speaking before the finale of the season, but you'll be listening to this after that. And I would say that, yes, perhaps there's been a bit too much politicking at this point. So I think we both hope that there's just a clean fight to the end and it's enjoyable for everybody and and the, the, the quickest person wins at the end of the day. Manisha, thank you very much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. I hope you've had fun. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, I think everybody will wish Racing Unleashed all the best and yourself for the future. It certainly sounds about what you talked at the start of our conversation about the plans for global expansion and, and new projects are very, very exciting. We'll certainly be keeping a close eye on it. And hopefully I'll get to see one uh, someday soon. That'll be nice. But uh, for now, thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Please do um, follow and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify if you're listening on there. Don't forget to visit traction.gg, the website, on a daily basis for the latest news. And if there's anything on Racing Unleashed, I'm sure we'll publish there as well. And just a quick note, this is the final episode of this particular podcast season for the year, but we'll be back in 2022 with some more guests. Thank you very much. Keep it pinned. Mm-hmm.